Good morning. We're here with Dr. Cheek today for our agricultural video production class. Dr. Cheek, please introduce yourself. Uh, well, first of all, thank you very much for having me. Uh, my name is Jimmy Cheek. Um, in 1965, I enrolled here as a freshman studying agricultural education. Uh, planned to be an agriculture teacher. I uh, stayed here two years, went to Texas A&M, graduated there. Uh, taught agriculture in high school in Beaumont, Texas for uh, four years. Went back to Texas A&M, uh, completed my PhD there, went to the University of Florida as an assistant professor, stayed there 34 years, uh, moved from a, uh, my role as a faculty member uh, to an associate dean, to a dean, and finally a senior vice president. And then about eight years ago, I applied, nine years ago, I applied for the job of chancellor at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. And uh, currently, I'm serving as chancellor of the University of Tennessee. That is wonderful. Thank you for sharing that with us. Um, our class put together a list of questions that we would like to ask you. Our first one is, how did, how did your time at Tarleton prepare you for your success? I'm the first in my family uh, to go to college, first in my family to graduate from college. Um, it prepared me extremely well from an academic perspective. Uh, when I transferred to Texas A&M, my grade point average actually went up just a little bit. I did a very good job here at Tarleton, but I did even a better job at uh, Texas A&M. Uh, the thing that uh, prepared me at Tarleton was a great faculty. Um, Joe Autry was my advisor. The building's named after him. Uh, Jesse Tackett. Uh, was uh, finished his PhD at Auburn University in soil physics and he taught me uh, uh, soils here and also uh, introduction to agronomy. Um, Dick Smith uh, taught me government, probably the hardest course I've ever taken. He gave blue book exams. Uh, do you all know what blue book exams are? We're not familiar. You have to go buy a blue book at the oh, bookstore. Yeah and uh, you have about six questions and you've got an hour and you write everything you can about those six questions and get it back. Uh, on the first exam, uh, I made an A minus, which was a very good grade in his class. And after, on, his, on my paper, he wrote a little note, uh, Mr. Cheek, would you please come see me? And so I did and he said, uh, your major is uh, agricultural education. I said, yes, sir. And he said, uh, my government students that are in this same class, none of them earned over a C plus. How did you earn an A minus? And I said, I studied. And uh, he said, how would you like to be a government major? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, I want to be an agriculture major. So it was a great experience here. Also in the first semester I was in school, I signed up, I enrolled in 20 hours of courses with four laboratories. And um, about the third week of class, I was up in chemistry and animal science and English and math and all the other courses that I was taking. But I was way behind in vertebrate zoology with laboratory. And so I went to see Dr. Autry one morning early and I saw his secretary and I said to him, uh, uh, said to her, I, I need to see Dr. Autry, he's my advisor. And she said, is it an emergency? And I said, it's very urgent. So I remember sitting in his office and uh, he said, um, what are you here for? And I said, I wanna drop a course, four hour course, vertebrate zoology with lab. He said, why? And I said, I'm taking 20 hours. I think I'm doing real well, but I just can't handle all the coursework this first semester. And he said, uh, is something wrong with you? And I said, I don't think so. And he said, um, so you want to drop it? And I said, yes. He says, what does an agriculture teacher make? And I said, what does that have to do with me dropping a course? And anyway, I answered the question. I said, about $7,000 a year. He said, how much does it cost to go to college? I said, about $2,500 a year. He said, um, 
how much would it cost you if you stayed an extra year in school? And I said, $2,500. He said, wrong. It would cost you $2,500 to pay for school, and it would cost you $7,000 in opportunity cost. I will only drop this course if you agree to take it in the summer. I said, Dr. Autry, I will do anything you ask me to do if you'll drop the course. Short of the story, we dropped the course. I did extremely well the first semester and extremely well the second semester. And I was named the outstanding agriculture student in the spring of two, uh, 1966. So that kind of help for me and asking for help and getting help was extremely important. And if I had one thing to say to students today at the University of Tennessee or Texas A&M or Tarleton or University of Florida, it, well, it is when you run into a problem, seek help from somebody you can depend upon. And that's one of the things that I learned at Tarleton. And life is a lot like that. It, uh, you, you get hit with a lot of different things in your life and sometimes just making connections makes so much difference and that's what I experienced here. Wonderful. What differences do you see in agriculture in Texas to Florida to Tennessee? Well if you look at Texas, uh, first of all it's a huge state uh, and obviously agriculture is very important in Texas. Um, um, if you look at Florida, it's a much more specialized agriculture that's gross value is equal to or greater than Texas with a much smaller land mass. But you produce things in Florida that are very high valuable crops, highly valuable crops, citrus for example. Uh, at the same time, t uh, Florida also produces a tremendous amount of beef cattle. Uh, produces enough milk for 18 million people in the state, so it has a huge dairy industry. The difference between the dairy industry in Texas and Florida is Florida, when I first got there, had, had, had dairies that were eight or 10,000 cows, and now it's not uncommon for one dairy farmer maybe to have 20 or 30,000 cows in different locations in the state of Florida. So huge kind of operations. Um, one of the largest ranches in the country is actually in uh, Florida. It's 132,000 contiguous acres. Most people don't think about that. They also produce vegetables and fruits that are very, very valuable. And a huge ornamental industry. Uh, Eileen and I have a friend that produces uh, 28,000, 28 million orchids a year. That's a lot of orchids in two different locations in the state. His, uh, he does tissue culture, and the tissue culture is done in China in little bottles, and the, those plants come to Florida. They grow them in Florida and then provide them all over the state. So a more specialized agriculture in, in Florida. Uh, tropical fish is a big industry in Florida. If you, go to the, if you go to a fish store and buy tropical fish, they're probably from Florida. So you don't think about all those things as agriculture, but they definitely are and require the same kind of support. There's also a huge urban agriculture in golf courses and lawns, and that's a tremendous size business. In Florida also, the water table is much higher, and so you've got major issues with fertilizer. So you have to make sure fertilizer is coated properly so it doesn't leach into the soil. Uh, in Texas, that's not as big a problem. So there are a lot of differences. If you go to Tennessee, it's more like Texas. You know, Davy Crockett was in Tennessee, and uh, Sam Houston was in Tennessee. And so there's a lot of connections, and the agriculture has a, a lot of similarities. One of the differences, though, in, t in Tennessee is it tends to get about 50 inches of rain across the entire state. It also has mountains on one side of the state, the eastern part of the state. And so that, that varies with the kind of agriculture. Very interesting. What are the main evolutions in agriculture that have made a difference in your life? Um, one of them is uh, this uh, course you're taking right now. When I was here um, at Tarleton and at Texas A&M, we had one part of our department was agricultural education period. And it was in the 
70s, 80s, that agricultural communication came along. I think it's an extremely important area. Tremendously good jobs in this area. Communication is getting more and more important in our society. So just from an academic perspective, having leadership and uh, agricultural communications in a department like this, I think is very critical. Um, as far as changes, mechanization, obviously, the sophistication, the environmental issues that are raised by agriculture and how we mitigate those environmental issues is more and more important. Um, another thing is the um, lack of knowledge by society about what agriculture, natural resources, forestry is and how important that is to our economy but also to our natural resource base. Um, and I think uh, one of our challenges is to communicate to a very urban society the importance of food, agriculture, natural resources, and the career opportunities. Most people don't think about career opportunities in agriculture. And um, there's a tremendous number of opportunities. And another thing, just like me, um, you know, I started in agriculture, and now my job is to run a $1.3 billion enterprise at the University of Tennessee um, to uh, manage the entire operation. We have a $136 million athletic budget. Um, we have a football team and basketball teams that people expect to do extremely well. There's always news about athletics. Uh, in a state. Then you've got the huge academic enterprise, the research enterprise, uh, a relationship with Oak Ridge National Laboratory, creating interdisciplinary PhD programs. And, and people, when I applied for the job at Tennessee, one of their questions was, uh, you know, you've been in agriculture all your career. How are you going to fit here as chancellor of the university? And so I went through the jobs that I did as senior vice president at Florida. I said, I work with the legislature. I've, I've got uh, appropriations from the legislature. I work with development. I raise money. I work with issues related to public relations and so forth. That's what a chancellor does. So it's the same thing. You just move from doing this to the chancellor's job, which is broader. And uh, so you've got the capacity to learn and change and morph and uh, uh, see yourself transform as a result of the education that you get here. What do you see for the future of agriculture? Well, it's changing. Um, in, in 1965, at the State of Hefe Convention, uh, I won the state public speaking contest. And the title of my speech was The Changing beef cattle industry. And uh, I uh, talked about the favorite meat in this country is beef. And then I said something like, every economist who has looked into the matter agrees that we will fork down even more in the years to come. And I said, this is how much we eat. But the reality is in 2017, that that's not a true statement. <laughs> we eat more chicken and other things, and we eat less beef. Uh, but as a total, we eat more beef because we've got more people. But so, so changing patterns. Um, in 1969, when I graduated, most people bought whole chickens. Do you ever buy a whole chicken? You do? Mm -hmm. Okay, very good, very good. Most people don't. They buy parts. Uh, parts of chickens, like chicken breast or chicken wings or chicken legs or thighs. One of our graduates from the University of Tennessee is uh, CEO of Tyson Food, and he produces all types of chickens. It's a huge, huge business. And so agriculture continues to evolve and change. At the time I gave that speech, I also talked about the USDA having less marbling in meat to grade prime, our choice, because the consumer wants less fat. And if you look today, it's much leaner today than it was then, much more uh, 
meaty type animals than they were in 1969, although we were moving in that direction because you look in 69 to 49, they really were fat. So uh, the change is going to continue, and what we've got to be able to do is adapt to that change and uh, embrace the change. Resist change is not the right thing to do, but ultimately we're going to have to continue to change. All right, our last question for you is, as an, ed as an educator, how did you influence future generations? Hmm. Well, um, I think the influence of an educator is um, trying to impact the lives of each individual student that you come in contact with in a positive way. Um, we've had two of the students that I taught in high school uh, to the University of Tennessee for a football game. So I still have some contact with, with students that I taught in high school, and that was in 69 through 73. And then uh, as a college professor, um, I still maintain contact with a lot of students. And I think, first of all, doing a good job teaching and making sure they're prepared for what they need to do when they leave, and then providing assistance to them and help. Uh, one of the students that I taught at the University of Florida was a National FFA officer and he's just been named president of Mursad Community College in California. He married another National FFA officer. Did I say national or state? He was, he was a National FFA officer. Married another National FFA officer that's from California and so he moved out there. He finished his bachelor's degree at Florida, went to Harvard and got a master's degree. And then he went to California. He started working at a community college. He's probably in his early 40s, and he's now president of the community college. When he got ready to apply for that job, he wrote me and said, will you be a reference for me? And I did, said yes. It's that impact that you have on students' lives, positive impact. And you don't know whether or not it really makes an impact or not and you don't see the impact many times. But that's why I'm in education. That's why I've stayed in education. I spoke at Joe Autry's um, retirement, and I told a story that I told you a few minutes ago. And he said to me after, did that really happen? <laughs> I said, uh, yes, just like I told it. I got to your office at 7.45 in the morning because I knew you got there early. And I only met you twice. I met you once when my uncle and I came up here for me to talk about Tarleton. And I met you the second time when you told me what to register for. And so that was the third time. And he said, I just don't remember it. I said, Dr. Autry, the reason you don't remember it is you did that for thousands of students. And for me, it's the most significant thing that happened. Because the Vietnam War was going on at that time. And your draft board said you have four years to get a degree. And if you don't make it in school, we immediately draft you. When I, I lived in Ferguson Hall on third floor. And when I came to school, um, we took uh, Christmas break. And then we came back after Christmas break. I know you think this is not possible. We took our final exams then after Christmas break. And then we took another break, and then we came back to school. So when we came back to school to begin the spring semester in 1966, I still remember what happened on our floor because probably about 20% of the men on my floor flunked out of school in that one semester, and they couldn't come back to Tarleton and they had their draft papers in their hand and they knew where they were going to boot camp and they knew where they were going in Vietnam. And I can remember my across the street, across the hall neighbor, he uh, 
was from a fairly wealthy family in uh, uh, um, El Paso. He had all these shirts, and he always sent them out to the cleaners. They were all cleaned and pressed. And he threw all of them on the floor. You, know, you don't think this is possibly true, but he threw them all out on the floor and stomped on them. Just so upset that he was leaving Tarleton. And I went back and thought about that. If I hadn't gone to see Dr. Autry back then, I might have been him because I just overwhelmed myself in the first semester. Now, the second semester, it made me take 19 hours and did fine, but not the first semester. So that this, this connectivity, this help that you can get from individuals, I think, is important. Great. Well, thank you so much for your time. You're that welcome. was all the five questions that I had for you. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's a few students that had other questions. Very good. Uh, would you like to drink water? I'm fine. <clears throat> Uh, so does anybody have a question? Okay. What was your favorite tradition while you were here at Carlton? Favorite tradition? Well, let's see. Favorite tradition? Uh, probably the Wainwright rifles. They're coming back now from the ROTC. Watching them perform. They had a they just did a fantastic job marching and uh, the other thing I guess is uh, at homecoming, we had to come out here uh, in front of where we used to have a dining facility. And we had different times we had to come by residence hall. And I remember one time I had to be there at two o'clock or something like that in the morning. And you were singing the Oscar P, Oscar P something. And I don't remember what it was, but that was, that was rememberable. I don't know if it was my favorite, but it's something I remember certainly. And uh, I enjoyed ROTC while I was here. Anybody else? Yes. Were you involved in any spare organizations or fraternities? I was not involved in fraternities, but I was involved in Collegiate FFA. And uh, that was about it while I was at Tarleton. And ROTC. And that took a lot of time. We had to go clean our rifles every week and march. and. On Saturdays, we had to go out and do different kinds of things. It always aggravated me because we had these black boots that you had to wear, and uh, you had to have them all polished. And then we'd go out someplace, and we'd have to go across, a, say, a half a mile piece of ground on our bellies, moving ourselves back and forth with our rifles. And your boots are all messed up. Your rifles got dirt all in it. You got to go back and polish them. So that, that took a lot of time. Uh, one more, anybody else? Did one? Okay. What about for you? What do you want to do? Um, I want to teach uh, agricultural uh, science and communications classes at junior college. Oh, is that um, right? Yes, sir. Very good. Yes. Do you have any advice for... Chris Vitelli is at Merced in California. <laughs> 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 we could contact him. Yes. I'll, I'll give you my card. Great. Thank you. You can send it to me. It. I'll see if he has an opportunity for an opening. You never Perfect. can't tell, you know. Always Connectivity. See, that's yes. important. Thank you. <laughs> that's good. That's good.